Hello and welcome to the Game Changers podcast. I'm Sue Anstis, a founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust and CEO of Promote, one of the UK's leading sports communications agencies. Before I introduce this week's guest, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Barclays for supporting this series of the Game Changers. We are focused on trailblazing women in football, which reinforces Barclays' huge commitment to the beautiful game. In 2019, Barclays announced the biggest ever sponsorship of women's sport in the UK as the Barclays FA Women's Super League became Europe's first fully professional women's football league. A big part of Barclays' sponsorship has been invested in establishing girls' football school partnerships with the aim of ensuring all girls in England have equal access to football in schools. And giving girls the same opportunities as boys to learn, participate and compete in football at school is close to the hearts of all the fearless women I talk to in this series. My guest today is Jo Tung, football agent, a director of the Women in Football Network and an ardent campaigner for equality in sport and the media. Jo spent 10 years editing 606, BBC Five Live's flagship phone-in show, and is now CEO of Tongue Tide Management, a sports agency specialising in talent management and production. I met Jo at their stunning offices at Tower Bridge, and I started the interview by asking her if sport was a part of her life growing up. So growing up, I was one of four, so two boys, two girls, and sport's what we did. So my mum and dad were very into sport. Um, My mum had grown up in sport. She'd grown up with brothers and her dad was a professional sportsman. So she was just around it growing up. My dad worked in sport. He was a sports journalist. So to us, it was just the norm. It's what my parents talked about. It's what they did in their spare time. It's what my dad did for a job. It's what my mum's family had always done. Her father was um, a rugby player, but they'd always gone to sport. So she'd been brought up in professional sports world. And so the four of us just did sport. So we went to football, we went to the rugby, we went to the cricket. I remember Sundays, really special days, like we went to Lords, we'd go to Canterbury, wow. we'd take the papers and have a picnic. I remember being taken down to the golf down at Sandwich when I think they had the Open there. Like When I look back, we were so lucky. I remember my brothers queuing up for Wimbledon. It was just... That's a lot to take, so much especially stuff. with four with children. Four children. Not, never mind the, log- the logistics of four exactly. children. Exactly. And then in the summer holidays, we'd go... We had a house in North Wales, uh, like a holiday home, and we'd go to the Europe pre seat like the Europe um, pre-qualifiers wow. for like the small teams in Wales that had qualified. Like, it's just what we did as a family. So it was just part of our life. And did you play sport as well? Growing up, I played with my brothers and played with my sister. I played football at school. And then when I went to secondary school, I went to an all-girls school and we did tennis, netball, hockey, athletics. I did everything. But I actually stopped my football when I was 11. I believe you went on to get your coach's badge at 18. Was that ever an option for you, coaching and refereeing rather than playing? No, I think I just knew that I wanted to work in sport, in football. I hadn't really worked out what I wanted to do. At school, I was quite academic, so I was quite good at English. So I think part of me thought, you probably should go into journalism or something. But football's what you know, football's what you love, so work in football. And because I hadn't played football for a good few years, I think I just thought, well, you better relearn football. If you're going to write about football, if you're going to work in football, you need to understand every role. So I thought I was going to do my refs qualification, my refs training, and I thought, no, do your coaching first. And looking back now, like, I was the only girl on the course. I mean, I must have been confident. Yeah, like, I just look back and I'm like, who was that girl? Did you you coach? No, never. That is ridiculous (laughs) because then I basically did my badge and then I ended up getting a job in the media and I ended up working. I mean, I did Breakfast Local Radio and I'd got work experience at the BBC, so I was working in my holidays there. I had a full-time job in McDonald's uh, to pay for all of this free work I was doing in the media. So, yeah, the coaching was a way of sort of, learning the game, understanding the game, giving me everything that I could have. Like, I knew football. I'd grown up around football. I'd watched football. I had a season ticket at Spurs since I was this high. I knew what I knew, but I always wanted to know more. You know, I might have wanted to do Saturday coaching or, yeah, you know, get back into it. I was I was never good enough to be a professional sports person ever in a million years. And so I think I thought, well, I'll just learn everything else I can around that. Your dad, you say, was a sports journalist, but, and it was that that drew you into it or made you aware of it even as a career path? I 
think it was just the the fact that I liked writing. I didn't want to present. I'm not, you know, I'm not a front of camera person. I was a writer. I liked art and I liked writing and I knew about football. Right. So actually it just made sense that, well, that job seems a very sensible job to do then. Right. And I think because I'd seen my dad do it, I knew that that job existed. Yeah. And this is why I think it's really important now to be quite visible in what I do in, in with all my hats on. Because I was really fortunate that I saw my dad doing this job and I was really lucky he would take us along. So in half terms, we'd go to the Spurs training ground and I'd watch him do his thing. I went to the World Cup in America in 1994 when I was not to give my age away, but I was 15. <laughs> and basically I'd just finished my GCSEs and my oh. parents said, well, if you finish your exams, I finished my exams, obviously you finish early in yeah, June. Yeah, yeah. And wow. I went out to America, the luckiest girl on earth, if you love football. Yeah, Unfortunately, yeah. England hadn't qualified, but we had a great tournament with Ireland and it was it was amazing. And I watched my dad and, you know, I knew then the reality behind what I thought was the glamour yeah, of yeah, tournament yeah. football because I'd been at home when my dad had been off. I remember the first tournament he went, well, that I remember was 86 and he went to Mexico. And I just, you know, my dad was in this hot, America, you know, <laughs> South American country living the dream for eight weeks. Yeah. And then when I went in 94, I realised that actually my dad was broadcasting from a hotel room on a dodgy ISDN line. It was very <laughs> stressful trying to send back interviews and beat deadlines and there was no rest. You know, it was exhausting. You'd get back from a match at midnight and then you'd be filing and then you'd be up having breakfast and doing interviews and you're on the breakfast show and blah, blah. Yeah. So I saw the reality of it. But I still loved it. Yeah. So, so getting started, then you began working in sports journalism. Is it the BBC? I think was the first. Yeah. So I got I got some work experience at the BBC um, one summer, and then I um, did local radio, which I think right. is just the best yeah. pathway. So, so broadcasting or behind? The no, scenes? always behind the scenes. Oh, okay. So uh, my job, at, my first job at local radio was on the breakfast show, and I'd get in at half four, five a.m. and I had to phone all the emergency services and find out if there'd been any activity overnight. So <laughs> genuinely, anyone who thinks this world is glamorous, let me tell you. What you do when you first start in local radio is you phone up the fire station, the police station and the ambulance services and you say, can I check if there was any events last night? <laughs> Honestly, to literally so I could yeah, write the news bulletin. Yeah. And so I did the breakfast show, my local radio in New Cross, don't re I don't remember sleeping in those years. I would do five till nine on the breakfast show and then I went and worked in McDonald's ten till six while I was at university. Um, so reading weeks, you know, every, you know, you think, oh, we've got a week's holiday. I'd be like, brilliant, I can do more days at the radio <laughs> station and earn more money in McDonald's. So I did lots of, lots of local radio and then graduated, did journalism at university, graduated and then really struggled to find a job. I was, you know, doing all my free work, yeah, of course, yeah. but to actually get a paid job was so difficult. And all the rejection letters I got, and I was like, I just want someone to give me a chance. Yeah. I knew I wanted to work in sport, but actually I had to apply for jobs that work in sport. Do you know, I remember having an interview at a very big football magazine, which I won't name, and I was so excited that I'd got this interview, and I, I was like, this is it, this is my big break. And I went for the interview, and I sat down, and the man interviewing me said... Yeah, I saw your application. I just I just had to meet this girl who thought she knows about football and who's got a coaching badge. And literally, I was there oh my God. as a commodity. He was like, I just had to see you. And he had no intention of giving me the job. It was the most excruciating interview. And I, obviously, I wasn't offered the job. I don't know if that made me angry. And I think lots of things like that happen along the way. And even if at the time I don't react, I've stored them up. Yeah. Because everything I do now and I know it's in me, it's, yeah. I'll show you. And I don't even know who I'm trying to show. Did it's it, people not, like him. Put you off at any point to think, actually, this isn't for me, as you were getting rejected or you weren't getting those opportunities? No. Because you knew it was what you I just, wanted to do. I just knew that it was what I was meant to do because I didn't know what else I could do. I genuinely, I'd never really wanted to do anything else. So how did you eventually get into uh, to the BBC? So I eventually, they had a talent pool. And so you, it was like a sort of a talent competition pool. Okay. And I applied and applied and I got through. And then you'd get through and they put you in whether you were in the sport pool or the news pool or the comedy pool. And because I knew about football, they put me in the sport pool and then you got shifts. So I managed to get a place on the then the new BBC Sport Online Five Live website. Yeah, yeah. So as as a writer, writing about football. Oh, I mean, it was, fantastic. but the, the best thing about that was when my sort of final interview, I did the interview and they were like, look, 
we, you know, you've been through a succession of interviews. You finally get to the final stage and they're like, right, you're, you know, you're going to get this. Can you work on New Year's Day? Because obviously it's the biggest day in football. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, then yeah, it was. Yeah. And I was, just, yeah, of course. So I, I, you know, I still remember I did, I think I did a double shift. But because I think <laughs> it was that there was like football from 12 and there was a late game that day. And I just remember finishing about 11 p.m. and thinking, I'm going to be sick. I'm so tired. Yeah. But it's brilliant because so I just your commitment to yeah the news that yeah you just say yes. I mean it was the dream. <laughs> and who were the other women around you at that time that you remember seeing? Were there women that that kind of were role models for you at the time? So when I got my work experience at the BBC, um, so I was 15 years old. It was that summer. I remember going into Broadcasting House and Five Live had just started. So yeah. Five Live was only six months old at that point, and we just had the World Cup. So I'd just been out to the World Cup, and I remember walking into the Five Live office, and there were two women who I still know now, Ellie Aldroyd was one, and Katie Nichols. And I'm just looking at them and thinking, I just want to be you. You're the luckiest women in the earth. Like, you are working on sport every day in this amazing building for the BBC. And this is where I want to be. And weirdly, I got my GCSE results that week. And I remember thinking, right, I'm I'm moving there. I'm getting there. Mm. I've got, like, good results. And I remember going in that morning with my with my results and thinking I'm going to be you I'm going to be you <laughs> and that was so important and it's it's part of the reason now why I think it's you know through women in football or through my work I do now why I'm so adamant about us lot being visible yeah, yeah. and talking about our jobs and what we do because I only knew about jobs in the media because of my dad yeah. and because he he just opened up his world to me looking back I'm so lucky he didn't even bat an eyelid that he took me to the training ground at half term, that he took me to a World Cup and just let me yeah, be, <laughs> be like, you know, I wasn't in the way, but ultimately he was working yeah, and I was yeah. just having to keep myself occupied. How lucky am I? And he just he just didn't think that it was weird taking me to football mm. or letting me watch him work. And then going to the, the BBC and doing my work experience and seeing Katie and, yeah, and Ellie. Action in action, just going, oh, there are people doing this. Oh, what job does she do? And they had completely different jobs. Katie was um, the production side, and Ellie was obviously front-facing yeah, as a presenter. Yeah. But just seeing that was, imagine if I'd walked into that room and it had all been men. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it would have put me off, but I would have probably gone, well, where, where's my place here? Yeah. Um, and so when you went back and you had that role, how were you received as a woman working in, in sport at that time? You're smiling. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that's when it got tough. <laughs> so I think up until that point, I'd been in a nice little bubble, apart from rejection interviews yeah, yeah. with men. Up until that point, I'd been in a nice bubble where I was accepted. I'd grown up with my brothers. They talked to me about sport. I'd grown up with my wider family. We spoke about sport. My dad had included me. My mum my mum knew more about sport than anyone I knew, so it was completely normal. Yeah, my yeah. little sister has a season ticket at Charlton as well. You know, we did we did sport. Yeah. And then I just got into this world where I had to start proving myself. And I had to know more than everyone else. And I didn't really like it. And I think I almost, I think I reacted quite badly to it. And I think I rejected it and kind of went, okay, you think I'm the four? I'm going to play the four. And I'm, I'm not, why have I got to prove myself to you? Like, I know what I know. Why am I being questioned about my knowledge? And I just felt if I didn't prove my knowledge 24-7, it was very tough. In a way that the, the men that were working there did not have to do. Of course they didn't. But also they had the confidence where they would just blag be it. very loud in the office and blag it. And, yeah, it was, it was quite a tough few years where I wasn't really sure who I was or what I was doing. Yeah. And I'd been... Not, life hadn't been easy for me up to that point, but... I'd always been smart at school. I'd always been good at sport at school. My family had always let me do whatever I wanted to do. And then I just got into the workplace and I was suddenly this young girl who wasn't necessarily accepted. And I I found it really difficult going out to football clubs. So... It's part of my job, obviously, you had to yeah. go to press conferences or, you know, go to football grounds, do match reports. And press boxes were very, very intimidating. And I didn't really know anyone because I was quite new to the business. And they obviously didn't know me, so I wasn't part of the clique. I wasn't part of the press pack. There were lots of assumptions, especially, you know, you turn up to collect your, your media pass and you'd be directed to the catering door or you'd go into the press room, where's the team sheet, love? Yeah. Where's the 
you know, where's the coffee or, you know, whatever it was, it yeah. was all these little, little things. I'd worry about what to wear to yeah, a press, yeah. you know, as a woman, you do have to, because you are judged on what you look like. Yeah. You are, you are as a woman in this industry. So you then have this uniform of, I always wear a black pile of neck, like always black pile of neck, black trousers. That's why I wear. And that was my safety, but I shouldn't have had to, how much makeup do you put on? Yeah. Like yeah. genuinely in normal life, I wear makeup. I don't want to go to football with lots of makeup on in case I'm judged. Yeah. So it's all these kind of extra things that as a woman you Never have to mind the about. job that you're trying Thank to you. do to I'm report on the football. I've just got to worry about who's actually starting and what formation they're playing and what I'm going to say at half time and yeah. what's like, what I'm going to put in, you know, those last 10 minutes of a match that are terrifying when you have to get your match report in on 90 minutes yeah. and everything changes and, you know, you've spent all morning stressing about something you really shouldn't be stressing about. So that was all quite difficult and... I struggled with it. If were I'm there honest. other women that you could talk to, align yourself with, or that were supportive of you at the time? Ish, but I think I was trying to prove yeah. that I was okay. It, yeah. yeah, and you don't want to be, I didn't want to be vulnerable. Now I really env- embrace my vulnerabilities. Yeah. Like I'm quite happy to say, oh, I really struggle with that. Yeah. But young I'm 20 years down the line. Yeah. yeah, as a yeah. young girl going coming in, I didn't want to put any seed of doubt in anyone's mind that I couldn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So I just, yeah, I can do that. Yep, no, yep, I'm on it, yep. And I was just this tough South London girl yeah. who just never, never showed any vulnerability. But then, probably about five years later, I met the women in football. I was going to say, I think it was wonderful Shelley Alexander that introduced Shelley you Alexander. to them. From, the and she was editing... Shelley was editing Football Focus. Football Focus yeah. And I was very lucky, because at the BBC, one of the wonderful things about the BBC was you could go on attachments. So even though I started in online match reporting, I then, I soon got a job on Right and Bright, the radio show for Five Live. So I did radio in the mornings on Saturdays before I did uh, reporting in the afternoons. And then I got an attachment to TV, um, so I worked on um, sports news. So you'd move around departments, mm. so I, I got to know Shelley. Mm. And she was always a great mentor for me. And she was really honest with me. And, you know, I'd apply for jobs in other departments and I wouldn't get them. I'd get really frustrated. And she was really good at kind of saying, well, this is where I think your strengths are and you should do this. And then she said, oh, we've you know I've set up this women in football group with um, Anna Castle. Yeah. Yeah, I think you should come. And I went along and... You know, everything sort of changed from then because at the time we were very, very underground. Like it was very much just pure networking. No one, we weren't public facing. Mm. We we weren't spokespeople for anything. We weren't lobbying anyone. So it was more like a, a supportive network a supportive at the beginning. network, exactly that. Just so that you could meet other women in the industry because there were so few of us. Yeah. And the reason it was set up was because exactly that in a press room where you walk in and I would just, I would end up talking to any woman I saw, yeah. whether she was working at the club or whether she was working in catering or wh- wherever it was. I would just find myself drawn to that. So when you saw another woman doing your job, it's like, oh, it's like, <laughs> like I felt when I was 15 and I, I saw yeah. Katie and Ellie. Yeah, yeah. It was like, oh, there's someone like me. Great. And that was, the, that was kind of how it, how it was founded when Anna and, and Shelley and Jackie we're in those situations and you you're a board director and you're um you know been involved right from the very start now so it's completely i guess transformed itself now so how are you involved today uh so i'm still a director i'm still a board member um it's it's been a massive labor of love i think we'll all be honest about that but from what it was so when you look back the first our first event was at spurs i think probably 12 13 years ago now and um, when you look how far we've come, I mean, it's it takes it takes time, and we were all vol- we're all still volunteers. Yeah, we're yeah. so lucky now. We've got some funding from Barclays, and yeah. we've got a part time chief exec, and we've got part time events member of staff. But the eight of us for many years just did oh, it. Just up and got on with got it, on with yeah, it so. because it was needed, and it had given us so much strength and such a great network. And now we've got three and a half thousand members, which is incredible. <laughs> and, you know, if you think we've built that from no one getting paid, like that's what you can do yeah. if you want to enough and if there's a need for it. And the network is amazing. Like the what people have offered. So football clubs have given us venues for free. All our speakers have never been paid. You know, everyone coming and telling their stories and being open. It's been so, so important in my life 
Excellent. And, and the new uh, Women in Football Leadership initiative, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, so one of the things that we realised is initially we were, we'd meet and it was a networking thing and we'd share stories and we'd give advice. And then actually now we have this formal programme, which is a formal leadership yeah. course, training course. And we've done it in London, I think, three times. It's been really successful. So we have uh, four levels, level one to four. So whichever sort of level you are in your career, whatever you feel you need, you will will do one and hopefully progress on to four. And so this week's the first time we've taken it on the road. So it's up in Manchester. um, And we've we've been really lucky. Barclays have really supported us on that. And Manchester City have, again, supported us in being able to take it on the road. We're sold out this week. And the so as board members, we all give our time for free. And we, we do the, the training. But it's, you know, Ebru, Ebru does this, this training. She's done it all her life. Monique, who's one of the directors at Brentford, this is what she does. Sue, who works for the LMA. Like, these are such experts in their field. Yeah. The fact that we can offer these amazing, like Jane Purden, our, chi- our chief exec, ex-club secretary at Sunderland and then head of policy at the Premier League. Like, these are so highly skilled, highly qualified, amazing women. Like, I just love going to... Le- I re-listen because <laughs> I relearn something every time. Yeah. I mean, my staff have all been on the course. I've done the course. I'm going up at the end of this week to do two days oh, um, training as part of it. It's amazing what we've done, but it's so important because there's nothing else yeah. like that for women in football because it is a niche and the things that that we experience as women working in this industry are quite niche. They're quite unique. Yeah. I'm not saying they're nu- unique in to any other sport, but I think in industry, yeah. football's a very unique, very special industry. Right. Challenging. As very a challenging. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Less challenging now than yeah. it was, I yeah. think. Um, and in terms of your BBC time, how long were you at the BBC for? Oh, well, years. I mean, I started there when I was 21, 22, and I only left 606 last year. Right, so yeah. I was edited 606 for 10 years, which was just my, my baby, yeah. my dream. And that was through um, the production, um, production company, else? something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I, I actually left the BBC as staff in 2009. So I'd been there, what, eight years. Yeah. And then I went to work for something else um, for six years. In fact, that was kind of another sort of making of me time because I went there to edit 606 and sort of head up their sports broadcasting. So we, we did lots of documentaries while I was there. But then while I was there, they had an agency. And so a couple of sort of footballers that I'd been working with, ex-footballers right. that I'd met through production work had started asking my advice about their careers and what they should be doing. And then sort of tongue-in-cheek, tongue in one of them kind of said, oh, you should be my agent. I was like, well, yeah, you can sign to the agency at something else and I'll I'll do the work, but they they know what they're doing. They're, they're, they're proper agents, you know. They've been doing this stuff for years. They've got the setup. And so, amazingly, something else said to me, yeah, if you sign them, we'll give you that opportunity. So I was allowed to do my day job, yeah. 606 and the documentaries. They basically taught me. So Grant Michaels was head of talent there and he kind of mentored me through and Steve and Jez let me do it and were very supportive um, and you became an FA agent then agent. Time, yeah. so I I had I think just through word of mouth I ended up with kind of eight sports clients so we had this kind of nice right. sports department at something else alongside the production stuff which was the dream because yeah two best jobs in the world. And in terms of um, 606, I guess for the people that are listening that may not know of it, so a little bit about the format of the programme and I guess. So 606 <laughs> is the it's the football phone-in. It's the UK's biggest football phone-in and it's a dream. So as a child or as an adult, when you, when you go to football, you get in the car and you put 606 on and that's what you do if you're a football fan. That's what happens. And so everyone everyone who's been at games or been watching football phones up and it's a two hours Fan. show <laughs> on a Saturday and a Sunday. And we used to do midweeks as well of fans. But it was the dream because it was real people, proper football fans, proper conversation, hilarious conversation. I mean, you know, crazy calls you know, sad calls, people who were lonely would call us, people who didn't have anyone to get in the car and talk to would call us. And they just became, like, it was my family. (laughs) But also in terms of the team that worked on it. So we used to have to commute to Salford and do it because when the BBC moved up there. So me and my team would go to Salford every weekend. So (laughs) all of this little gang 
and the 606 team. Yeah. And do you know what? It was the best. It was the best way of getting new staff into the BBC. You know, it's really hard to get a job at the BBC, but you could become a phone op as a freelancer. Right. So it was interesting. I got a DM from someone on Twitter the other week, and he said, "Hi, Joe. I just I've been meaning to contact you for ages. I just wanted to say thank you to you." I was like, well, I remember, you know, this, he worked for me in, in Manchester. Uh, it was nice to hear from him. And he said, I just want to say thank you to you. He said, I was a chef and I used to listen to the radio 24-7 when I was a chef and I was obsessed with 606. And he said, on a whim, I basically, I always wanted to work in radio and I applied for a job on 606 and you gave me a break Aww. and you basically gave me a job on 606. <laughs> and he said, and now I'm an assistant producer on it. And I honestly, it's like, the, you know, one of those like proudest moments. I was like, I wanted to scream from the rooftops because he was... Amazing. He knew football and well, I didn't care what well, I don't know job you do. Ca- yeah. Do you know about football? I used to give him this test um, when they'd come for their interview. I'd give him like a test and it was just stupid stuff like, what's the abbreviation <laughs> for Nottingham Forest? Don't be putting an S anywhere near that. <laughs> or, you know, how to spell Middlesbrough because they always put the, the R in the wrong place. So just little things yeah. that you need to know. And they used to, I think they used to think I was really pernickety, but my point was... If you can't spell a brief right or you can't spell something right, how is the presenter ever going to trust you yeah. on anything? Because yeah. at some point I might have to say, there's breaking news, you need to say this. If they don't trust me yeah. on anything, if they think I'm a bit slapdash on anything, they're not going to trust me. Yeah. So it's just those little things that, you know, yeah, I was I was hard on them and I was, I did have standards, but there was a reason. And how was it being a female in that environment from the beginning as well? Because it doesn't feel like it's a particularly uh, gender balanced, I guess even on the call in, I imagine, uh, I can't imagine the percentage of females calling in. Well, funnily enough, the production team now, I think, especially in London, is almost 50-50. Yeah. But that's because our recruitment, when I was at something else, I said I'm going to recruit not in the same way the normal BBC would recruit. Yeah. So I said I'm going to go to local pirate radio stations and just basically find the people who talk about football and know football and love radio. Mm. So that's how we started to change it. And the production, so it's Shooting Shark, who produced it now, a very old friend of mine, Simon Gross. And in fact, Jess, who's my yeah. ass- assistant here, so she works on it. So oh, I feel right. like, yeah, she's, she's, um, she's a phone up on it, which is brilliant because I feel like, good, I've got the next generation yeah, on it. Um, but yeah, it was tough. Especially the presenters were fine with me because... They knew I knew football. Yeah, so they just accepted yeah. me. But there was times with other presenters where I remember telling some presenters off for banter in the office and it didn't go down well at all. And I'm, you know, I, I can have a laugh outside the office, but there's certain things that I don't want in the office. Yeah. And it didn't go down well. And I was made to feel that I was a bit of an outsider and I couldn't take it. And it was jokes about, I looked like. But you've got um, a duty of care to the people that you're working, you know, your young people coming through exactly as well. Exactly that point. And this is where I go back to, like, there's standards, there's things that if you accept them, mm. then the young men that work for me or see that yeah. think that it's okay to do the same. Yeah. Um, and that was tricky. Especially when you work, like, I worked so hard. I worked seven days a week for a long time. And then when you're getting a hard time at work... Yeah. you sort of go, well, what's the point? What am I fighting for? Yeah. Why am yeah. I the one going, don't say that in the office, it's not really appropriate. Because it would be easier just to sit there and go, all right, just let that one go over your head, hum. And do you think it's changed? Do you feel it's changed in that environment? Oh, yeah. it's changed so much. Good, yeah. Oh, the things, the things that used to go on in the office or in the workplace when I started, you would, you'd be out like that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is good, which is good. It's amazing. But it's generally because there's more women in the office. Yeah, yeah. So it's not accepted. and Absolutely yeah. not accepted. And also there's just more women working in football. Yeah. There, there honestly is. Yeah. You know, whether that's down to women really, like, whether it's down to people going, well, we've got to be more diverse in our workforce and deliberately looking at recruitment. Yeah. Yeah. Or actually, if it's just women knowing that these jobs are available yeah. to them, whereas 30 years ago... They probably wouldn't have considered a career as a football writer. No, it's all the things you're saying. It's a bit of that seeing it and knowing that you can then be Absolutely. it and aspire to do so. How can you be it if you don't see it? Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we say this all the time, but genuinely, how do you know? I would never have thought I could be a football agent. I didn't know a football agent until I met Rachel Anderson, at, um, as in I didn't know a female football yeah, agent, yeah, yeah. until I met Rachel Anderson through Women in Football. And that's the only reason I went, oh, oh, she can do it. Yeah, that's, you yeah. know... 
I want to be like her, she's incredible. But I wouldn't have known that that job existed, especially if you go to an all-girls private school. Yeah. <laughs> I was fortunate because my parents just went, do whatever you like. Yeah. Of course you can be a football journalist. Of course you can do your... I mean, think how many young girls aged 17 went to their parents. I've just written to the FA, Mum, <laughs> to um, get a job on the Euros. Yeah, normal. So I was doing my A-levels and I remember I... I remember putting my hand up in one of my A-level exams and going, yeah, finished. They were like, time's not up. Yeah, but I've... And I literally... Because I had to get the tube to Wembley because there was a night game <laughs> and I had to work. That's where my priorities lay. Now, imagine... I mean, my parents probably wouldn't be too happy to hear about that <laughs> right now. But anyway, it's, it's, it's done me OK. Well now, uh, yeah, yeah, I've done OK, <laughs> Mum and Dad, I promise. But think how many families would not have encouraged that or yeah. just questioned it or wouldn't have given them a lift to yeah. the coaching course on a Wednesday night. So, yeah, I was just really fortunate. But then I feel all of us now, and especially across the board of women in football, the jobs that those women have yeah, or have yeah. had are off the scale. I mean, absolutely off the and scale. And a duty now to... Sh not a duty, but to share that and to let to people tell, know about that. Tell to us. tell their stories, yeah. to bring women through, to show them opportunities, to share our networks, to introduce yeah. people to good people. That's what men did in business for years. And women are... We're notoriously bad at networking because we all think we're terrible at it. And we're all a little bit shy and we all... We are. I think it's just naturally in us. You know, I'm, I'm so much better now, but for years, I would, I would hate going to events. I'd hate walking into a room. Now, I, I kind of know people, so I know I'm always going to know someone. But we, it's in us that we think we're bad, at, we're bad at networking, so we don't do it. So we just wouldn't go to the events. So, you know, like, I remember... When I first started out, I got invited. There was an amazing organisation. It wasn't women in sport, but it was something like that. And they were doing a golf training day. So we got invited. So we had some, some sort of networking or something in the morning. And then we had golf lessons. And they basically said, we're giving you golf lessons because none of you go on the golf days yeah, when you get yeah. invited at work. And it's so true. Because yeah, I'd grown up doing golf with my family, but I would never have said I was good. My brothers were actually always, they were much better than me. But I knew the basics. Around, yeah. But if you'd invited me to a golf day at the BBC, I wouldn't have gone. Yeah, yeah. Whereas what, what this group did really early on was say, right, we're going to equip you, which is what we're trying to do with women in football. Yeah. We're trying to give you all the tools you need so you can just do your job. So that when you go to your football ground, you are not worrying about what to wear. You're not worrying about how to carry yourself. You're not worrying about who you're going to know. Yeah. You're not worrying about who you're going to talk to. You've got your line if you meet someone new for the first time. You know, all these little things. Yeah, to give you that confidence. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So in 2015, I think you set up Tongue Tied Productions Media. What is the correct Tongue -tied title? Tongue Tied Management. Yeah, Tongue Tied exactly. Management, fantastic. Oh, what were your plans for the business as you, as you launched? So when I set up, I literally just thought, you've just got to work hard. There was actually no big plan. It was, okay, you can do production and you've got this wonderful set of clients. But there was no big business strategy. And actually... My actual strategy is just work hard <laughs> Fantastic. and see where you get to. Now that I'm sure, you know, there'll be many business people screaming at, <laughs> at their, uh, their wirelesses or their iPads at this. But, yeah, there, there was never a big plan. It just kind of happened, but it happened through hard work. Yeah, it didn't yeah. just magically. I didn't wake up one day and have this. It happened through a lot of hard work and just a lot of I'm really, I say I don't have a strategy, but I'm, I'm really sure of my core values and what I stand for. So the purpose of the productions is to just make good stuff and make stuff that I enjoy and make stories that I want to tell. And the purpose of the agency is to look after people yeah. and to manage careers. So what I would see is there were lots of agents that were very good at one area, managing one area of sports people's lives. But then they'd get to the end of their careers and what were the pathways? And where I'd worked in the media for so long, I'd seen this sort of growing pathway for ex-pros mm -hmm. to become pundits or um, broadcasters, in the case of sort of Golina, Corey and Wright, presenters, Dion Dublin now. And I just thought, who's doing that? Who's managing their pathways? And they need to be thinking about these things early doors. Yeah. So the, the smart sports people were coming to me five years before the end of their careers and going... I know I've got five to eight years left on my career. I've, yeah. I'm probably at my last club, I might have two moves in me. But I'm thinking about building my profile, 
what do I want to do after? Getting my coaching badges now, trying a bit of the media, seeing if I like it, not waiting until six months after I've retired and waking up and going, oh dear, (laughs) where's my career gone? So, So that was the kind of ethos behind it. And then we're just really straight. I mean, I don't want to sound boring about it, but I'm very straight. I know the going rate of what someone should get paid. It's been very interesting, especially around women. So when I started, there were no female pundits. Like no female pundits. And so after the 20, well, I'd signed Enya Luko. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, She was a previous guest. Yes, she was. Yes. (laughs) So Enya was my first female client. Excellent. And we started working together before the 2012 Olympics. So Team GB, obviously it was home Olympics. And started working with Eni, and you know, Eni's this this wonderful person who's got so many um, sort of strings to her bow, and had eighty two caps for England, yeah. by the way. <laughs> I, I think and it was yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it was eighty two at the time, whatever, whatever it was at the time. And so I started badgering the football programs to say, "Look, I've got this amazing, eloquent star. You know, she's been playing for England since she was sixteen years old, fifteen years old." She knows, she loves football, she knows football, it's all she knows. She was playing at Chelsea, she was playing for England. What, you know, what more do you want? And they'd say to me, mm, no, no, she never played in the Premier League because so we can't have her talking about the Premier League. Right, but you'll have some journalists on <laughs> who've never played in the Premier League, but they can talk about the Premier League, can they? I'm allowed to write about the Premier League, but I've never played in the Premier League. But this woman, this super sports star who's played for her country and Great Britain in Olympics <laughs> and plays for one of our biggest teams. And she can't be a pundit. Anyway, two years it took. Wow. Two years. And then eventually, match of the day, said, right, let's do it. Let's yeah. get on as a pundit. She was brilliant. Of course yeah. she was brilliant. Yeah. And open the doors. Open the doors. Because well. then they go, right, who else is out there? Because yeah. any can't do every programme. Yeah, yeah. So what else have we got? Yeah. And now you don't see a football programme without a female on. Yeah. And that's down to any. And down to... So what people don't see is that didn't just happen on that day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's years of persistence and persuasion and reasoning. And open-minded people, open-minded editors to go, OK, let's try this. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so there's, there's lots of credit to lots of people for making that happen and for continuing it. And, and has it ever been an issue for you as a female agent in terms of, I guess, a sort of typical picture of an agent perhaps is as older male in that, you know, been around the block a bit in that environment? Or have you not found that? Possibly, but I think because I didn't become an agent till later on in my career, say later on in my career, but, you know, I'd kind yeah. of, I've, I've done my young years. Yeah. I think I don't acknowledge it and I can use it to my advantage because actually people do notice you and people do yeah. want to speak to you because you are different and they are interested in who you are and what you're doing. Yeah. So rather than letting that make me scared now, I try and own it. I'm not saying I do it all the time. I mean, you know, there's there's various things that I go to and, you know, my friends will I'll say, to them, oh, I'm a bit nervous, I've got to go to this thing. And they're like, Joe, you've got this. <laughs> you know, and I'm allowed to show that side to my friends. Of course, when I arrive, I'm, I'll own it. But now I try, really try and turn it into a positive. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we are different. Women are different in business. I have different ways of negotiating. I have different ways of persuasion. I have different ways of getting what I want. And that's not, that's not good or bad. Yeah. That's not to say I'm better than a man would be. There's lots of things I can learn from, a way men, from the way men do business, but I also think there's lots of things bring. they can learn Absolutely. from the way I do business. So I really try and use it as a positive now and try and just go, okay, I might be the only female in this AGM of 100 men, <laughs> but it's okay. Don't stress about what you're wearing. Just be you. You know, you deserve to be here. You know your stuff. It's okay. And, and you do have to give yourself that little pet talk still. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, in terms of contracts, very different levels of contracts for the men, men and women. So how, how has that been? I was really shocked when I started when I started representing females, I was really shocked at the money. I still am shocked. So essentially, if you pay, if you play for certain clubs, you're fine. You can earn a living, a nice living. You paid well. Clubs will look after you. There's certain other clubs where I just, I don't know how 
they're meant to take a living. The annual wages that some of the Premier League players and, I mean, absolutely the, the Championship players, it's a disgrace, if I'm honest. And, you know, I'm, I'm so excited about where we are with women's football. But the problem is the finances are still not there to the point where if you had a career, so lots of the girls obviously had other jobs yeah. because they were all semi-pro. Yeah. They all had jobs. It's a very difficult decision to go pro, Absolutely. believe it or not. Yeah, no, I, can, I can imagine that, giving up your pathway and... Yeah. Giving up your job, I don't know, as a teacher or in the city or whatever it might be, for this wage. The, pro the problem is you don't turn it down because if you're a footballer, the dream is to be a professional footballer. Of yeah. course it is. But actually, there needs to be some serious conversations about the value that we're placing on that and what we're expecting of them. And just the comparison between, you imagine as a female, if you, you, know, you play for a club and you're carrying that brand, and you do have the weight of that brand on your shoulders because you wear that kit and you wear that badge every week. I just feel the disparity is it's it's too much. And does it, do the women get angry about that? Because you think it must be they just are they delighted to be being paid for something that they love that they wouldn't have been ten years ago, five years ago. I don't think they do get angry. I think I get angry on their behalf <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, I think you know they're living they're living their dream. They're yeah, playing football, yeah. and I'm the one on the outside, sort of going, well, hang on a minute, where's the backing? So where I get frustrated is. There's lots of good feeling. There's lots of people saying the right thing about, you know, what, supporting the women's game and putting their name or their brand to a game. But actually the cash isn't there because we don't have a massive TV rights deal. Yeah. We're not going to get it from ticket sales because we don't play in grounds unless we suddenly decided to two games a season at every... I don't know, say you played two games a season at a, 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 a men's venue we might get some money in from ticket sales. But that's not a realistic, no. sustainable business model right now. So we're not going to get money from ticket sales because average attendance is, what, three, 4,000. Yeah. So we can't, we can't sustain the game on ticket sales. So then we can't sustain the, 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 the game on TV rights because there aren't, yeah. they're not of a value at the moment. So then we need sponsorship. Well, Barclays can only pump so much money into it, yeah. and they, you know, they have put money into it, but only to a level. So then it's down to the clubs. Yeah, yeah. That's fine if you're a Chelsea, a United, City, a City, an Arsenal. What about if you're a Sheffield United, or if you're a? I mean, look at Birmingham. Clubs can't afford that. They yeah. cannot afford to go. Here's ten million pounds that we'll we'll put into the women's team because they're not getting it back at the moment. So who's, who's going to put, it's so, such chicken and egg, yeah. who's going to say, right, we are all going to write off £20 million. So every male side of the club has to put £20 million into their women's, women's club. Who can actually afford to do that? Not all of them. Where do we get this money from? So what is the answer? <laughs> I personally think that we have to cream it off the men's game. The difficulty is because of the split between the FA and the Premier League. Yeah, yeah. So either the Premier League are going to have to take over the women's Premier League and then they're going to have to take a percentage of whatever comes from the men or the men's TV rights and pump it into the women's game because it's all under one umbrella. Or the FA are going to have to do some sort of deal yeah. with the Premier League or with the Premier League clubs to do this. And the broadcast rights are coming up again. They're coming up next, yeah, 21 yeah. summer. Yeah. But again, see, I had a really interesting conversation, Barbara Slater and I did a panel at Edinburgh TV Festival. I was complaining about the lack of uh, women's football on terrestrial yeah. TV because my nine-year-old niece can name me every single player in the Arsenal. Men's starting yeah, 11. Yeah, yeah. Spurs, men's starting 11. Chelsea, men's starting 11. She knows a few of the Arsenal yeah. women, but not all of them because she doesn't see them. No, no. Because the highlights programme is on late on a Sunday night, or well, only just this season, BBC4 on a Monday. Yeah. There's not live They'll games on yeah. terrestrial TV. Yeah. BT Sport do their good coverage but it's not it's not terrestrial tv barbara slater said very honestly the problem is we can't show that as a spectacle if the grounds aren't full yeah, yeah. it's not a good sporting spectacle and pff, absolute fair point but why don't you show two games a season 
that we have at the men's ground. So, for example, the Arsenal Spurs game yeah, at yeah. White Hart Lane was incredible. Yeah. I can't. I think it was thirty-two, thirty-three thousand. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. The Stamford Bridge one. Yeah, was Chelsea. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. The Etihad, yeah. amazing. So even if you only showed those, you know, you could do 10 games a season yeah. that become an event, become a big thing. Because when I was growing up, we just had the FA Cup final and it was on Easter Monday or Bank Holiday Monday. I can't remember which one it was. And that was the only women's football I ever watched because yeah. it was on BBC One on the Bank Holiday Monday and there was nothing else. You know, there was no other sport on that Bank Holiday Monday. Yeah. So we sat down and we watched the women's FA Cup final. And that's how I knew women's football. But at least I, I saw some. Yeah. Whereas my nine-year-old niece doesn't, doesn't watch it, women's no. football. And I guess then that, I thought you were going to say on the Barbara Slater side, is then there's that challenge of the free-to-air versus actually selling the rights to make the money to... There's, there's that dilemma as well, almost. Absolutely, which is why if, you know, the sensible money's on, yeah. you do a joint bid. So we get X amount on Sky or BT or Amazon, and then we get those big flagship... Yeah, personally, get the big flagship ones. But yeah, make it... Think what Sky have done with, like, Monday Night Football or yeah, even Friday yeah, Night Football yeah. or the, the Sunday 4 o'clock. It's an event that you don't want to miss out on. Yeah. And if you're not watching it, you have no-one to talk to in the office the next day. <laughs> You've got nothing to say on social media because everyone's talking about it. Because think, like, the World Cup. Look what yeah. the BBC 11. did. 11.7 11. 11. 11. million. Yeah. That's because you didn't want to miss it because yeah. they hyped... They made it an event. Yeah. If they hadn't done everything around the build-up and the promo yeah. and the excitement across all their channels yeah, radio to TV. direct you to that game, yeah. it would just be another thing, which is what our weekend FAWSL games often are. Yeah, they just yeah. happen because you're not telling me it's exciting. No. You're not telling me why I should care. You're not telling me the stories because there's no... Yeah, where's the football focus yeah. for women? Yeah. Where's the profile pieces? Who's yeah. telling me about the characters... The only time we ever find out about the, the characters in women's football is around a World Cup. Yeah, yeah. So then we care for them. So we care for the Lionesses. We care for the, the Scotland team because we suddenly know their stories. But in the the Women's Super League, I know them because I work in it. Yeah. So I care deeply. And, I, you know, we try and, you know, share the stories yeah. and the Telegraph, Anna Kessel, with, with, you know, daily coverage of women's football. So we're getting stories, but it's Not slow progress. It? You can't just have one newspaper yeah. doing it. Yeah. So yeah, it's 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 got to be a concerted effort across the board. And you've obviously got some fantastic women and men on your roster. How do you choose the the talent that you represent? What are the kind of decisions that you would go through? Generally, every client we've got has more than one string to their bow. So I like I like people who are more than what you think they are. Yeah. So they've got a talent but they've got another talent and they've got another interest and they're doing this. So everyone's just got something that makes them unique. And to be honest with you, I just like them. I mean, obviously, I want to be able to you know, spot talent. Do I, do I see potential in them? Do I think they're talented? Do I think they're at the top of their game? Or can I help them get to the top of their yeah. game? Yes, 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 that's the business basics. But I have to just like them because you, you, know, you speak to them every day, you're, they're trusting you with everything. You're trusting them to deliver. You're putting them forward for, for work and you're trusting them to be able to perform. And, you know, it's, it's their reputation, but it's also my reputation. Yeah, yeah. If, I'm, you, if I'm using my contacts and saying, use this person, use this person, it's because I believe in them and I don't ever want a client that I put forward for a job just because it's a job. Yeah. I want them because I'm proud of them. And, I, you know, I genuinely, I say I've got like 32 children <laughs> because I... <laughs> So I'm so, there's been so many moments where I've just wanted to scream with pride, like when any yeah, yeah. is the first female pundit and she's amazing. Or when Dion does his first time on the hammer and is incredible, or, you know, when they do something out, out of their comfort yeah. zone, you know, when, when Tracy Neville's at, at the World Cup, when Emma wins the double, it's yeah. all, you know, all these things. When Erin made her, her debut at the World Cup, when Leah made her debut at the World Cup, like you just want to scream with pride. Yeah. But yeah, you have to like them. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously, you spent your whole career in in football. How do you personally deal with that negativity around the sport? So, in terms of some of the crowd behaviour, the you know the homophobia and the, the kind of other issues there, has that is that an issue for you personally, or do you see the the bigger, better side of the sport? I think I've become less in love with the sport, actually. So, as a fan. I watch it very differently. There's a couple of times, so I've got season tickets at Spurs, 
follow Wales internationally and I do get passionate but I think I'm a little, because I know I'm just a little bit more cynical yeah <laughs> um so I don't enjoy it necessarily as much as I probably did I get quite frustrated with a lot of it I mean we had a, a well publicized case with any a couple of years ago and that was really testing and really made me think this game is not what I want to be part of and this industry is ugh. But then actually, you come through the other side and you think, well, we hopefully made some change. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And, you know, she stood up for what she believed and that's what we're here for. So, at, yeah, I'm a lot more cynical. I'm definitely less in love with it, but I still get great enjoyment from it. Do you worry that the women's game may take on too many of those elements of the male game as more money comes in and success? Absolutely. You're nodding. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, you see it already. There's so many people swarming around. There are agents. I'm, it's almost like in researching you and looking at agents, it's like suddenly out of the blue that in the last year or so, all these football yeah. agents. Yeah, because they see a new market space yeah. and they know the women's game is growing. Now, I'll be honest with you, I've been saying this since about 2010, 2012. Yeah. And well, when, when we all went professional, when, when the game went professional, it did, it did change lots. But there's still not much money in it. No. And this is what people need to realise. There's so much hard work in it and not a lot of money. So if you're getting into it because you think this is a good business, quick business opportunity, trust me, (laughs) eight years, this is not. But actually in terms of building something and believing in something and doing what's right, it's the most rewarding thing in the world. And it will, of course we'll get there. We might never get to the level of the Premier League as a global entity, but it will definitely develop business wise but it's it's very interesting seeing everybody trying to jump on the bandwagon yeah, yeah. and and finally in, in closing and i mentioned to you before i guess young women starting out in their careers and coming in to, to sports today if you had some sort of gems of advice or something you would share from your learnings what, what would you say to women coming into the football sector today and any any guys really know your stuff if you know your stuff and you're passionate yeah. no one can ever take that from you so know your subject, whatever that's, whether that's football or cricket or whatever area you're working in, know your stuff. Read, watch, live it, go to football. So many people come for interviews or say that they want a job with me or apply for jobs and I say, oh, so do you watch much football? Not really. <laughs> you can't work in football if you don't love and watch and live and breathe football. So that, that would be my first. The other thing is probably just say yes looking back I used to say yes and then walk out the door and go oh my god how am I going to do that but I would always say yes because my front facing thing was yep very capable and it's interesting people that I like working with now are those that I'll throw something at and even if they're not sure Mm. they'll go yeah no worries leave it with me and if they come back 10 minutes later and go Joe, can I just ask you what you meant by that there's something about the, the thing about saying yes and is gaining someone's trust so you've you've got to know that ultimately you can deliver, yeah, yeah. but you'll find a way. You know, don't say no, don't turn down opportunities because there are opportunities. But I think often as women, we are less willing to say, yep, got that. Yep, no worries, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Our natural, well, my natural instinct is like, oh, Joe, are you sure, Joe? And there is that research, isn't there, about women not putting themselves forward or taking jobs unless they can do 90%, 100%, whereas a bloke will throw his hat into the ring. There's a job spec. If I can do 99% of the things, I'll apply. A man, 60%, and they'll apply. But this is what I mean. Just take take a bit of that, because you can do it. You find a way. You ask people. You look around. You ask for help. You get support. You work with others. Of course you can deliver. So, yeah, it was, and then just, just confidence. Life is so much easier when you're a little bit more confident. Yeah. And I look back at the things I used to worry about, just took so much energy, and you don't need to worry about those things. It was fantastic to hear Jo's passion and enthusiasm for her work, and I'm incredibly grateful to her for her openness and honesty about her career path. Thanks so much to Barclays for their support of the Game Changers podcast which enables us to take the stories of these amazing, fearless women in football to a huge new audience. And thanks also to my executive producer, Sam Walker, at What Goes On Media. If you've enjoyed this podcast, you can make sure you don't miss out on future episodes by subscribing to The Game Changers 
And you can find out more about all the guests at promotepr.com slash game changers. Contact me on social media at Sue Anstis or find the Game Changers on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. If you could take a moment to give us a rating or leave a review, that would be fantastic as it does make a huge difference. And it's been so wonderful to hear how much people are enjoying the Game Changers podcasts. My guest next week is Maggie Murphy, Women's General Manager at Lewis FC. It's an extraordinary football club with massive ambitions, the first club in the world to pay its male and female players equally. Maggie's had a fascinating career path, having worked for Amnesty International on human rights issues, Transparency International, the world's largest anti-corruption organisation, and the Sport Integrity Global Alliance, where she was Director of Public Policy and Sport Integrity. Mag is also the Director of Communications at Equal Playing Field, a charity dedicated to advancing women's equality in sport from grassroots to elite levels. We don't have to follow the same rules that men's football has followed. A lot of people are disillusioned with football, with men's football, and we have this amazing chance to do things differently. The Game Changers. Fearless Women in Football. Football.